when I was in college, I, I went to a Catholic school. I graduated from Loyola Marymount uh, College. And uh, as one of the requirements, uh, one of the, the general ed requirements was uh, classes on the Bible. And one of the classes I took was on the Gospel of John. And uh, being a Catholic school, some of the teaching uh, staff was uh, the, the priests, the Catholic priests. And uh, for, for the Gospel of John class, I had Father John uh, as my teacher. And Father John, uh, you know, you, we think about over our lives, our academic careers, however long they may be, and, and there's always a handful of teachers that we remember and stand out for various reasons. Father John is one of those teachers for me because Father John, uh, he had this just physicality. For, at first he talked, he kind of talked like this. And yeah, can you hear it? I'll, I'll, I'll let you in on it. The other thing was, as a, a college student, um, I didn't recognize it for what it was, but he had a bad hip. And so he would come, he was always like five minutes late to class, and he'd come in like this, good morning, class. And then, you know, he'd start, and all of a sudden I realized, like, he's kind of like John Wayne. He had this John Wayne thing going, and he'd start talking about Jesus. And I was like, so... I mean, besides that, uh, he had these, these, these uh, black, thick-rimmed glasses, um, and uh, in the end, I mean, he had a personality that engaged us, of course, but ultimately, it was his passion for God's Word that really drew us as students uh, into the subject matter. And I'm sure many of us could think of teachers that we've had in our lives that um, whatever it was, it w and I think a, th a common theme would be their passion for the subject matter drew us in, right? Um, and ultimately, uh, you know, what they taught us has an imprint on us and ultimately, um, you know, creates us into who we are today. If we were to uh, think of some of the teachers uh, in our lives, who, who, I mean, who would you nominate for a teacher's hall of fame? And I'm sure all of us can already are thinking of some teachers right now in our, in our mind's eye. What if we were to do that collectively? What if we were all, if we all just decided today we were going to somehow try to figure out the top 10 teachers of all time amongst us? Could we do that? Well, according to the internet, uh, maybe not. I, I Googled, I, I Googled, uh, top five teachers of all time, and I ended up reading through three different lists. And with the exception of two teachers, none of the uh, none of the the lists agreed with one another. Now, two of the teachers that were on all of the lists that I read anyway uh, uh, read were Confucius, and the other one was Aristotle. Now, Confucius, Confucius, of course, is the founder of Confucianism. He's a Chinese th a thinker and a social philosopher, and uh, his teachings influence China, Korea, Jap Japan, and Vietnam cultures. Um, and his his philosophies uh, included um, moral uh, morality for individuals and morality for the government. Hmm. <laughs> uh, so here's a quote from Confucius, and I, and I like this one. Choose a job you love, and you'll never work a day of your life. Awesome. Uh, Aristotle was also on all of the lists that I looked at. Aristotle was taught by Plato. Uh, Greek philosopher. Aristotle was a Greek philosopher. He was taught by Plato, and he was the teacher of Alexander the Great. Here's a quote from Aristotle. The mark of an educated mind is to be able to entertain a thought without necessarily accepting it. As I said, uh, Aristotle was a Greek philosopher, was Greek philosopher, and he wrote on tons of subjects. He wrote on physics, metaphysics, poetry, theater, music, logic, rhetoric, politics, biology, and zoology. That's a lot of stuff. Now, having looked at these lists, I was surprised by who wasn't on any of the lists that I looked at. Anyways, can you guess who that was? Jesus wasn't on any of the lists that I looked at. Really? Jesus, the one who brought the world, for example, 
a common story that we all know, the Good Samaritan. After, you know, the Good Samaritan, we have hospitals named Samaritan hospitals. We have uh, those things that you see on RVs, that sticker, the Sam's Club, that's short for the Samaritan Club, helping others out who are hurt and, and struggling along the road and so on. Hmm. I guess that doesn't much have, have much influence on the world. Jesus, not on these lists, but the one who brought the world what we uh, call the Beatitudes. And if you don't recognize that word, the Beatitudes, uh, you might recognize these words. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. These words, as familiar as they may seem to us, were radical when they were spoken. Because they challenged the established religious thinking of Jesus' day. So Jesus... Not on the list of top teachers of all time. Really. The guy who brought us the Sermon on the Mount. Familiar words to us like, you are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. Familiar words to us because it's in the Sermon on the Mount in which Jesus taught us the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and so on. The Sermon on the Mount, in which uh, includes the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto... Okay, so these things sound familiar to you. (laughs) I'll say more about the golden rule a little later. One person wrote that Jesus' teaching has resonated with people throughout the generations. Jesus' teachings ring with truth that is self-validating. I'm amazed that his name wasn't at least on the lists that I looked at. So despite what the internet says, number one on our outline this morning, most people would agree Jesus was an an exceptional teacher. And I'm going to stop there. The rest of it goes, well, who's whose primary theme was the kingdom of God. Now, I wrote this point uh, with a specific thought in mind. Because as a believer and as Christians, we would say, well, if Jesus is the son of God, which we believe, then his teaching is more than, he's more than an exceptional teacher. He is the exceptional teacher. But what was in my mind was, I, you know, I thought, like, if we went out and surveyed folks uh, and had, like, a survey, and we gave them a questionnaire, and one of the questions were, do you believe in Jesus, uh, or, or are you a Christian or not? And let's say people marked the box no. And then we continued on that survey, and in that survey, we asked the question, do you believe Jesus was a great teacher or an exceptional teacher, and so on. I believe that I have no evidence to back this up, by the way. This is just my opinion. (laughs) But I just have this sense that people who don't believe in Jesus would still agree that he was an exceptional teacher. Now, that's why I wrote it the way I did. Uh, An exceptional teacher whose primary theme was the kingdom of God. And it's the kingdom of God, this theme that I want to talk about for a few moments. The kingdom of God is Jesus' centerpiece of his teachings. For hundreds of years, the Jews had been expecting a decisive intervention of God to restore the glory of Israel and defeat its enemies. We've been reading a little about that in the story. When John the Baptist and then Jesus proclaimed that the kingdom of God was at hand, it was certainly understood in terms of these Jewish expectation of God restoring the glory of Israel. However, the kingdom inaugurated by Jesus is not an earthly kingdom that was expected. The kingdom of God inaugurated by Jesus is a spiritual kingdom that grows in the hearts of people, and it will conclude with the eventual sovereign rule of God and the defeat of evil. The kingdom of God is not some faraway place begins after we die, the kingdom of God is here and now among us and within us. In Luke chapter 17, verse 20, 
This is a living translation. It's put this way. One day, the Pharisees, that would be uh, the teachers, uh, teachers and, and kind of uh, managers of, of the religious law, the Pharisees asked Jesus, when will the kingdom of God begin? Jesus replied, the kingdom of God isn't ushered in with visible signs. You won't be able to say, oh, it began here in this place or there in that place. The kingdom of God, Jesus taught, is within you. Other translations say the kingdom of God is among you. This is further explained in today's scripture, Jesus' parable of the sower, also known as, as, as the good and bad soil, in which Jesus explained the kingdom of God is like a seed planted in the hearts of people. Each of us has the seed of the kingdom within us, and, and it grows in direct relationship to how much we care for it how much we're open to receive it, how much we're willing to nurture it. So, like this, uh, Jesus also taught about the kingdom of God uh, in a parable, a story of the mustard seed. Now, I brought with me a mustard seed. Can you see it? (laughs) I don't have a mustard seed, but if I had a mustard seed, (laughs) it would look a lot like this. (laughs) Now, Jesus taught that, uh, he was talking about the kingdom of God, and oftentimes when he taught in parables, he would say, the kingdom of God is like, dot, 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 and then he would just tell a story. And uh, he he talked about the mustard seed, the smallest of seeds, but when you plant it, it can grow into something so big that even birds can nest in it, period. That's the end of the parable. I had an experience of this a couple years ago. My wife and I went hiking, not a couple years ago, this was like 10 years ago. We call it BC, before children, so it was at least 14 years ago. Um, And uh, we went down to uh, one of the the bottom of Sycamore or something, and uh, it was after a rainy, it was actually this time of year, and it was after a rainy year. Um, We could use that this year and uh, in years to come. And we were, I I remember how kind of excited I was because I was looking up at the hills on the south side of Simi. We were going to hike up this trail, and as we started up, I mean, I was, we mustered blossoms everywhere. Just the, the hills were covered with that yellow. And I thought, oh, this is going to be so cool. And in my mind's eye, I thought, oh, we're just going to be like walking through like mustard up to our ankles. And it's just going to be kind of like this fairy tale kind of <laughs> hike. It turns out that, uh, I don't know if, it, well, it, I don't know if my expectations were blown. Oh, I, I don't know. It was weird. We started hiking up the trail and the further we got up the trail, it, it, the mustard wasn't up to our knees. The mustard was over our heads. And I was, it was kind of like, well, you couldn't see anything. <laughs> Maybe that's why I was disappointed. But at the same time, sure enough, there were little birds that were darting through the mustard bushes. And, uh, and I thought, wow, G- what Jesus taught was true. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> A mustard seed this small can grow into something big enough that birds can nest in. So notice there's a, now don't get lost with my my crazy stories. We're talking about Jesus being an exceptional teacher and his major theme was the kingdom of God. And and the language often that he used was agricultural. Uh, It spoke to the age uh, and and the generation that he was teaching to. I want to share one more with you and I think this one uh, is an an interesting point. And uh, it's called the parable, uh, the story of the wheat and the weeds. And he says, the kingdom of God is like, dot, 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 a farmer who plants a a field of wheat and um, and then goes to bed. And that night, his enemy comes in and plants seeds of weeds amongst the wheat. And so as the wheat starts to grow, so do these weeds. And so the, the workers of the farmer approach the farmer and say, listen, it looks as if you've got weeds in your wheat field. Do you want us to go out? And pull the, pluck the weeds out, weed the field. And, uh, and he says, no. The farmer says, let the weeds and the wheat grow up together. And when the time of harvest comes, we will, we will separate the weeds from the wheat, and we will bundle up the weeds, and we will destroy them. End of story. That's what the kingdom of God is like. So what's that story about? I think this is really interesting, because it tell, it's teaching us that the kingdom of God coexists with the kingdom of this world. 
Now, there will be a time when the kingdom of this world will be bundled up and destroyed. But in the meantime, we have two kingdoms that coexist with each other, that are growing together. That kind of explains a lot, doesn't it? I mean, think of the terrible things that happen in our world. And sometimes people can go to blaming God. Why has God allowed this to happen? Well, Jesus teaches that the kingdom of God is like two kingdoms growing up together. But eventually, one will be destroyed. Okay, so Jesus was an exceptional teacher whose primary theme was the kingdom of God. So, what are Jesus' primary teaching, teaching methods? Number two on your outline, Jesus taught through parables. Jesus taught through parables. Uh, we've looked at some of those already. In the Bible's New Testament, we have 46 recorded parables of Jesus. And according to Mark chapter 4, verse 34, uh, it reads, Jesus did not say anything to the people without using a parable. I love uh, this definition for what a parable is. A parable, you might want to write this down, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Jesus' parables embody much of his fundamental teaching, and they are genius. They're genius because they're simple, and they're memorable, and oftentimes they have one point. They are genius because they work as a kind of social commentary of the world Jesus and the disciples lived in. They're genius because they often blindsided the people he was teaching, his audience, with an unexpected anti-hero. His parables are genius because they often are received paradoxically, which is to say they, they almost uh, land like a riddle. An example of this, uh, a good example of some of these points, the, the anti-hero, the, the social commentary, uh, the riddleish the, is that a word? R the riddleish nature of parables uh, is, I already mentioned, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Um, if you're not familiar with it, uh, I'll try to summarize it quickly. But essentially, there's a guy traveling up the road. He gets robbed and beaten and left for dead on the side of the road. Uh, two people pass him on the road. They're uh, religious. Uh, they're religious types, and. Uh, and instead of helping him, they, they bypass him. They actually avoid him. Um, and then a third person comes along, and that is the Good Samaritan. And the Good Samaritan, seeing this person who's left for dead on the side of the road, puts him onto his donkey and takes him to an inn where uh, he cares for him and, and provides medical care for him, and then pays the bill uh, by, and actually pays above and beyond the bill, saying, take care of him until he gets better, and if there's any additional expenses, I'll come back and pay those expenses as well. And that person was a Samaritan. Now, that may be a familiar story to us, but it was radical and earth-shaking when Jesus taught it, because a Samaritan was the religious and... Um, um, racial enemy of God-fearing Jews at the time. And so, can you see how that might lend itself to social commentary, number one? Because Jesus is teaching the kingdom of God is like, and then he tells that story. Secondly, it's the anti-hero, right? No one in that audience would have expected that the Samaritan would have been the hero. And then uh, it, it ends like a riddle because those people, when they first heard it, would have been walking home that day going, okay, Jesus was talking about the kingdom of heaven and he told that story. And when they worked through the, why was the, why was the Samaritan, like why did he become the hero? When they worked through that part, then they have to sit there and consider, okay, what was it about the Samaritan that we're supposed to learn from that story? And so it's a riddle. It's a story that needs to be figured out. The parables are genius. I mentioned this before. They were simple enough and memorable enough to survive a period of approximately 40 years of oral tradition between Jesus' death and resurrection and the um, you know, ink to paper with 
the writing of the first gospel, which would have been Mark, there was basically a period of, of maybe 40 years at the shortest. Now, during those 40 years, how did the stories and teachings of Jesus survive? Well, these parables were simple enough, um, and, you know, they had a punchline, so to speak, that were memorable enough that people could retell them again and again and again. And they survived that period, and then, obviously, by being eventually written down, were passed on to us thousands of years later. Another interesting characteristic of the parables is that as you read them, uh, they often function in two ways. Um, the parables seem to reveal God's truth to those who are looking for God's truth, and the parables somehow conceal the truth from those who are indifferent to what God may be teaching. So there are times in the Gospels where we see Jesus um, kind of pulls aside the disciples to explain the parables. Other times uh, we see that the disciples come after Jesus and say, okay, you talked to the crowds. Can you tell us what that one was about? Um, Mark 4, verse 34, again, the, the second half of that verse reads, When Jesus was alone with his disciples, he explained everything to them. A perfect example of that is today's uh, scripture that we had on the video, this uh, parable of the good soils. He, after he told the parable, he then explained what that parable was about to the disciples. The kingdom of God is like... Well, the kingdom of God is like these seeds, and some fall on a hard path, and that hard path is the heart of a person who hears the good news of the kingdom of God, but doesn't understand it, who's hard-hearted, who doesn't receive it. And then Satan comes and it snatches away the seeds from the path. The kingdom of God... It's like these seeds that were sown amongst rocky soil. It represents a person's heart who hears the message and receives it with joy, but because that initial faith and reception has no depth, the seeds don't really take root. And when trouble comes, when difficulty comes, when challenges face their lives, they let go of it quickly. The kingdom of God is like the seeds that were sown amongst thorny soil, uh, thistles. And it represents a person who hears the message of God, but the cares of this world seem to strangle it out. And then, of course, the kingdom of God is like the seeds that were sown amongst good soil that represents the heart of a person who receives the message, who understands it. And that soil, God teaches, uh, has a harvest of 30, 60, and 100-fold. So the method of Jesus' teaching was using parables. And um, unlike the parables, Jesus also taught directly. Number three on your outline. Jesus taught directly. Although there are many examples of Jesus teaching directly, I want to focus our attention on one example of this. Um, I want to focus our attention on what has become known as the golden rule. Now, the golden rule, those three words, the golden rule, are not in the Bible. But we have come to know uh, a certain scripture as the golden rule. But before we talk about the golden rule, have you ever heard about the silver rule? The silver rule is a phrase that's been coined to refer to a collection of sayings from Eastern religions which sound very similar to Jesus' golden rule. For example, Confucianism from the Analects. Do not do to others what you do not want them to do to you. From the Maha, let me see if I can say that, the, the Mahabharata of Hinduism. This is the sum of duty. Do not do to others what would cause pain if done to you. And from Buddhism, hurt not others in ways that you yourself would find hurtful. Every time I read that, I'm thinking of Yoda. I <laughs> hurt not others in ways that you yourself would find hurtful. <laughs> um, so, 
In contrast, Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, Jesus taught, do unto others what you would have them do unto you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. Now, Jesus twice in the Gospels, it, it says that phrase, this sums up the law and the pro prophets. Jesus is basically saying, if you were to take the whole Old Testament that we've spent months studying together, if you were to take it up and just wrap it up, it, that's it. Do unto others what you would have them do unto you. Now, all of these phrases sound similar, don't they? But they're not. The Eastern sayings are similar to Jesus' golden rule, but are stated negatively. The Eastern sayings are similar to Jesus' golden rule, but they rely on passivity. Don't do anything, and nothing will be done to you. Jesus' golden rule is a positive command, and it, in contrast, is proactive, encouraging us to show love. Eastern religions say, refrain from doing things. Jesus teaches, do it. The Eastern religions say, it is enough to hold your negative behavior in check. Jesus says, look for ways to act positively and then do it. So uh, some have accused Jesus as borrowing the idea of the golden rule from Eastern religions. However, the texts for the Confucianism and the Hinduism and the Buddhism that I just cited were all written about five, between 500 and 400 B.C. Uh, Jesus' foundation for what we call the golden rule comes from Leviticus chapter 19, verses 18 and verses uh, 34. And that was, uh, the Leviticus was written at about 1450 B.C., which is, well, predate, predates the silver rule by a thousand years. So the golden rule is an example of Jesus teaching directly. Lastly, Jesus, number four on your outline, Jesus taught through life experiences. Jesus taught through life experiences. Now, towards the end, if you uh, had read this chapter of uh, the story, um, towards the end of this week's chapter, there is, as if out of nowhere, the miracle story of Jesus and then Peter walking on water. Now, i got to be honest. When I read the chapter and landed on that, I, I was confused by it. What's a miracle story doing in the middle of a chapter of the story that is primarily focused on Jesus as a teacher? Well, you know, everyone has a predominant learning style. Some of us are audio learners, which is to say that as an audio learner, we learn by hearing things, we, hear, we learn by listening, we understand and we remember things that we've heard. Some of us are visual learners, which means uh, by, we learn by seeing things, by, by seeing pictures, by reading. We understand and remember things by sight. And then another learning uh, style is the tactile learner. A tactile learner is a hands-on learner. You learn through doing things. You learn through experiencing things. Now, question. Based on the story of Peter walking on water, what do you think Peter's learning style was? He's a hands-on learner, and Jesus knew that. Hmm. So I'm really curious in preparation for this, and when I hit on this, I was like, I want to go through the Gospels and read all of the stories of Peter and see how many of them are experiential in nature. Now I'm kind of curious. You see, more than once, uh, Jesus used the experiential method, the, the tactile learner style, to teach. He did it with Peter. And on the night of his arrest, when Jesus washed their feet, Jesus did it with all of the disciples as well. So, we shouldn't be surprised when God starts to leverage our life experiences to disciple us. Unfortunately, all too often, God uses difficult situations to disciple us. Unfortunately for us, all too often, God uses the challenging situations in our lives to disciple us, the, the negative experiences in our lives to disciple us. 
um, you've heard it said, you know, there are two ways to learn. You can go through a challenging experience yourself and learn the lesson, or we can learn the lesson from hearing the, the difficult experiences that other people have gone through and then learn the lessons from their, heart, from their heartache, right? One way sounds a little more wise than another. So I, I want to conclude a uh, couple last words here. And one is to draw your attention to the blue card in your, your bulletin or in, in your bulletin itself. Um, every week we try to have next steps which build on the day's message. And the next steps, if you look at it, uh, I, I'm just encouraging us uh, because I was thinking about teachers. I'm really biased in this area. My wife is a teacher, and I see how hard she works. Um, take some time to thank a teacher. I don't know. Maybe you find them on Facebook and say thanks for, for, or maybe there's a teacher for your kids that you really appreciate. Take the time to say thank you. In fact, are there any teachers here today, elementary teachers, preschool teachers, here, any administrators? Just raise your hand. I want to thank you. Thank you for the work that you do couple. There are couples who are too afraid to raise their hands. I see you. Uh, memorize Mark 4.8. I know sometimes memorizing things is, is challenging for some of us. Uh, it reads, still, others, uh, still other seed fell on fertile soil. Now, here, here's my point in trying to memorize a verse that has seven words in it. Can we handle that? <laughs> By memorizing it this week, it's my encouragement to kind of sow the seed, that as we go through this week, it, it reminds us what God is calling us to be and what God wants us to be. God wants us to be open to his presence in our lives. God wants us to have hearts and lives that are open to the spirit at work. And, um, and by doing so, God works in us and through us. So we are called to be that fertile soil. Uh, reflect on how God has used the experiences in your life to teach you about faith in him. We're called as Christians to be introspective and contemplative about our lives, uh, recognizing that uh, God can teach us through these things. Lastly, and I'm excited to announce this, uh, after we conclude the story, uh, which will be in June, um, our, our summer series is going to be a, a, a message series specifically on Jesus' parables. Every week, all summer long, we're going to be looking at one parable and digging deep into each one of those. I love the parables. They're so rich. And uh, if I know people go on vacations during summer and, uh, and are in and out. Uh, but I encourage you when you're in town to, to get into church because uh, it's going to be really rich material that we're covering. Last thought. Jesus was a phenomenal, extraordinary teacher. So much so that the people of his generation came to believe that he was no ordinary man. Which then begs the question, who is he? Who is Jesus? I encourage you this week to read chapter 25 of the story and come back next weekend as we explore the answer to that question.